Now the brain can become very interesting because we can regenerate the tissue. We started to think how we can trigger those symptoms or how we can trigger the generative processes. And from our perspective, at the end of the day, we want to repair. So you want to induce the repair mechanism. And speaking about the repair mechanism, there is always a bottleneck for the repair mechanism. Welcome to Longevity by Design, a podcast designed to give individuals access to the leading scientific information in the field of longevity. The ability to add years to your life and life to your years needs no opinion. Join us as we ask science to take the wheel. In each episode, Dr. Gil Blander joins a co-host and an industry expert in the field of longevity, shining a light and getting the answers to the key question, how can we live a longer, healthier life? Welcome back to Longevity by Design. In this episode, I sit down with Dr. Shai Frati, a medical doctor and an expert of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Dr. Efrati explained the inner working of this therapy, emphasized how oxygen fluctuation triggered the body's regenerative process within the brain. He also underscored the importance of precision and exactness in the medical-grade equipment, cautioning against potential pitfall of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. The conversation was interesting for me because this is a new and mostly unexplored trend that might have the potential to help many of us who suffer from cognition issues, which have been hard to treat effectively in the past. Learning about this treatment option might be beneficial for everyone that would like to live better longer. Enjoy the discussion and don't forget to rate and review the podcast. Welcome to Longevity by Design. How to live a longer, healthier life. We are produced by InstaTracker, your science-based guide to optimize your body from the inside out. Our guest today is Dr. Shai Frati. Hello, Shai. Hi. Great. It's a, it's a great pleasure having you today, Shai. And uh, I think that the research that you are doing is uh, fascinating for me, and I hope that it's also fascinating for our audience. And I would like to start with a question uh, about your uh, background and uh, specifically to, uh, the introduction that you can uh, provide us uh, a bit about uh, why have you decided to become a, a physician, a scientist, and uh, specifically studying uh, brain and understanding what is uh, hyperbaric uh, oxygen therapy is doing? You know, there's a long a long story to each of those questions. Okay, just the question, <laughs> why did you become a physician and why you decided to go to medical school? That's, that's why it's something you can write a book about. So actually, in my case, if I would like to start with that, I, I never meant to go into medical school. Actually, you know, in Israel, after you've been serving in the military, usually you take a long, a long trips. I was in a journey in South America and Central America. And in one of the time, you know, at those days, there was no cellular phone. So you can realize how, how old I am. Yeah. I, I remember those days. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we used to go to trucks for two weeks, three weeks, something like that. And there was no communication. At that time, I was in Guatemala after coming up from South America. And when I got back to the motel or whatever you want to call it, because it's not exactly a motel, it's, it's a little bit below that. <laughs> Between the tent and the motel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when I got back, the way to communicate was, you know, there were notes from other people spreading all over and the, and the notes say, you are being asked to come immediately to the Israeli embassy. I said, wow, what's going on? So I went to the Israeli embassy and I knocked on the door or ring, actually ring in the bell. And then the guy who is guarding the embassy is telling me who you are. I said, Jai Frati, you have to go in now. And you know, you can imagine what, what kind of thoughts you have in your brain. And I was going in and then the, the people in the embassy put me sitting in the chair and gave me the phone and said, you have to speak with your mother now. The kind of scenarios of running into your brain are something bad happened. And then I'm speaking with my mother and she tell me, Shai, you have to come back to Israel. I'm saying, 
why I'm just finished my way in Guatemala. I'm going to Mexico to work. I have been offered to work in construction over there because of those days I knew a bit of Spanish. So it wasn't a bad thing to work in construction. And that's what I did in Israel. And then she told me, I have signed you to the medical school and you have been accepted. accepted and, and two days from today, you have an interview. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to come back. I said, what do you mean I've been signed to medical school? So I, said, no, I did that. I, I signed you in. I decided that that maybe you will get accepted. So you have to come back because the interview is in two days. I said, oh my God. And that's really strange. Oh. I said, I don't know what, we, what to decide. I will decide tomorrow morning. And the day after, you know, I went to sleep. I said, do I have to decide? No, I said, no, I will go to sleep in the morning. I will make my decision whether I'm flying to Mexico or flying to Israel. And of course, I woke up in the morning and I said, I don't know what to do. I said, okay. At those days, there was no internet. So you cannot order the ticket by the, by the internet. You had to go actually a place to meet a person to an embassy, sit in front of a patient as a person and ask him to schedule the ticket for you. So I said, you know what, on my way to the travel agency, I will make my decision. And on the way, I'm thinking Israel, Mexico, cons, prawns of each. And I'm coming in, and you know, behind the agency, there was a big picture of Jerusalem. And I said, you know what, this picture is not here by chance. I'm going back to Israel. <laughs> that's, that's how I started medical school. And actually, every year I said, this is my last year in medical school. So next year, I'm going to study physics because that's what was my primary goal was. And, you know, it passed and I found myself at the end of the training with an MD on my title. And that's how I went to medical school. So, you know, things happen by chance. I don't think that it was a chance. Your mom may uh, push you to be a physician. <laughs> you know what? You know what? Yeah. Nagging is like the elephant is doing like this. Yeah. <laughs> nose to the small baby. That's, that's nagging. That's a big nag. She decided for you. <laughs> decided that. Yeah. She decided yeah. that. And, you know, the same happened, the same happened with everything we are doing with regard to the brain because Actually, when I was in medical school, I was taught that neurons, neurons in the brain, cannot, cannot be regenerated. And whatever you have, you can only lose. You cannot get nothing. And if you have this kind of paradigm in your set of mind, it means that all you have to do is walk with cell cultures. And try to target a neurotransmitter or, or receptor or an enzyme. But let's say that your ability to make a significant change is not significant. So needless to say that neurology was not attractive because you understand that, that you cannot do something meaningful. And that's why I decided that I'm going to internal medicine. And then I went to nephrology and I enjoyed doing research. During that time, I established a research unit in my medical center, which is the Shamir Medical Center, previously called the self -Alfair. At the beginning, I used to do some research in the Weizmann. And then I decided that I need my own lab. I established the lab, animal facilities, biological molecular. I had a big, a big lab. And then something like 20 years ago, there was a study that was done on birds, stinging birds. The goal of the study was to understand, not our study, it was done in the U.S. The goal of the study was to understand why birds learn how to sim, why those birds can and the other birds cannot. And as a side effect, People who have done this research notice that there are something like, that looks like stem cells in the brain. And when I saw that, I said, oh my God, now the brain can become very interesting because we can, we can regenerate the tissue. And then I went deep. 
correlation with that, there was a small chamber in the hospital that, of course, wasn't used for those indications, hyperbaric chamber. And when we come to think about it, we started to think how, how we can trigger those symptoms or how we can trigger the generative processes. And from our perspective, when I'm saying our, I mean my team, my research team and colleagues, we don't care if it's a wound in the leg, if it's a damage to the cambry, it's the damage to the brain. At the end of the day, we want to, to repair. So you want to induce the repair mechanism. And speaking about the repair mechanism, there is always a bottleneck for the repair mechanism. Uh, we call it thermodynamic. I, I hate saying that word because when, as I say it, I'm losing everybody. But maybe now I will not lose because it's not at the beginning of the talk. But what thermodynamic, <laughs> what thermodynamic means is that you look at the tissue, you understand what is the current biological bottleneck that prevents this tissue from doing whatever it's supposed to do. And from our incentives, generating the regenerative capacity. And then all you have to do is to open that bottleneck. And then good things may happen. Okay, that's, that's how we work. And with regard to tissues, and indeed it doesn't matter if it's the brain or, or the leg, there is usually four elements that prevent good repairments or good recovery. And if we want to induce the recovery, we should target those four elements. And what are the elements? The first element is that you need you need energy. It doesn't matter what you want to do. If you want to build the house, build the road, build the tent, you need to invest energy. The same in our body. If you want to build something, you need to energy in order to do that. So this is the first element. The second element is that you must have a trigger. Now, you are not going out of the bed in the morning unless you have a trigger. You will stand there and spend your whole life over there. So, so we need a trigger to invest we need the building stone. The building stone are what we call stem cells, cells that can differentiate into the missing tissue. And the last thing, you need the access. Because if you don't have the access, then you cannot approach the target damage. And the access in our body are actually the blood vessels. The, the blood vessels enable us to, to access the tissue. So those are the four elements. And in order to target those four elements, we are using what we have now. We are playing a lot with different stuff, but, but the most available, effective tool that we have currently on human beings is what we call hyperbaric oxygen. But it's not hyperbaric oxygen therapy as people in the U.S. think about. It's actually fluctuation that we generate with the oxygen. And I will try to explore that more. The most powerful trigger that we have in our body to induce regeneration is actually hypoxia. It's actually lack of oxygen. Why? Because, you know, a long life, this body and other bodies, any living creature on this planet knows that if there is hypoxia, it means that there is a damage. And those hypoxia that initiate the generative process. So you can take a person, hold his breath, or stop his heartbeat, and then you will have hypoxia and you will induce regeneration. There is only one problem with that. It is not healthy. Okay? You will need this regenerative capacity. And we were thinking, what the body actually sends? Does the body sense absolute values or does the body sense the fluctuation? There is no absolute enough. Everything is relative. I will say that I'm fortunate or unfortunate, not based on the absolute value of what I have, but based on what my neighbor has. If he have more, I will say, I have, but look, if I have less, I will say, what's going on over there? Okay, or be very fortunate. The same in the body. So we are tricking the body, meaning taking people in order to increase the oxygen level to the level that we need. We need to compress more molecules per square. And that, that is what, why we need the hyperbaric chamber. We are compressing the air, molecules, more molecules of oxygen. 
airways, to the lungs, to the blood cells, and then to the rest of the body. And then when people are sitting in the chamber, we ask them to take the mask off. So when we are two atmospheres with 100% oxygen, the blood oxygenation increase from 100 to 1500, taking the mask off, making pass the line back to around the normal level. And this decline is being interpreted by the body as hypoxia, as lack of oxygen, even though we have extra oxygen. And this is what we call the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox. We are inducing all the things that happen during hypoxia in hypoxygenized condition, condition where you have extra energy that is needed to for the repair mechanism. So once we are doing that, if is going up, HIF stands for hypoxic induced factor. It's a promoter, the trigger, VGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, mitochondrial proliferation, changing the metabolism, generation of new blood vessels, stem cells proliferation, all the elements that are needed for repairments. And then by doing that, we can demonstrate for the first time in humans that actually we can induce new blood vessels in the brain, which we call angiogenesis in the brain. And we can induce also neuronal stem cells proliferation and neurogenesis. And that's, that's a huge breakthrough because just like we repair in wound in the leg, we can see also in the brain. Great, g very good uh, background. I, I think that you made it very clear for our audience and I really appreciate it because it's a very complex subject. And a few question that I think that uh, will uh, help our uh, uh, listener uh, to understand it uh, even uh, better. So you mentioned angiogenesis, so maybe we can uh, elaborate uh, about that. Uh, another point is the, uh, uh, you said that uh, it's angiogenesis in the brain, and we know that there is a blood-brain barrier. So maybe explain what is a blood-brain barrier and uh, explain whether blood go into the brain or there is something else. Maybe we'll start with those two questions. Okay, so when we are speaking about angiogenesis, we are speaking about generation of blood vessels. People can see that clearly because if you are doing exercise with your hand and going to the gym, you will see that blood vessels are being generated. So actually the body can do that. Having angiogenesis in the brain is a huge thing because usually, this is a longevity show. So usually what happened to all of us along the lives is occlusion of the blood vessels. The process is being called atherosclerosis. It's narrowing of blood vessels. If it's in large blood vessels, like we have here in the neck, which is the carotid artery, we can target that easily by putting stents, doing bypass, things like that. However, if we are dealing with the small blood vessels, that's a big challenge because nobody can put stents yet in the small blood vessels or bypass the small blood vessels. So the only way to bypass that is by generating new blood vessels that are going around the occluded blood vessels. So this is why we need angiogenesis, especially if we're speaking about age-related functional decline. It may happen in the brain, it may happen in the heart, it may happen in other organs that we have in our body. For example, if we want to have erection, erection is blood flow. Okay? So, unsurprisingly, the same angiogenesis that we have in the brain, we can demonstrate that in, in the myocardium. We have just finished analysis in, in one of our research studies that demonstrate that by MRI of cardiac MRI, we can demonstrate angiogenesis in the heart. We have previously done also with regard to the penis. We have MRI protocol that can show us the blood flow in the penis. So surprisingly, the same angiogenesis in the brain and in the heart and in the penis are happening with the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox. We should not use the phrase hyperbaric oxygen anymore because when people feel say, think about that, they think about the tube or a sack full of air that they are going inside. It is totally, totally not it. It's a completely different protocol, okay? When people are using our research for this tube or sacks full of air, 
this is this is crap. This is this is not what we. Okay. Can can you uh, Sh- Shai? That's a very good point. Can you explain why uh, buying I don't know the the sack of air at Home pair. Depot. <laughs> at Home Depot is not working and they using the uh, apparatus that you are using that I assume that it's uh, built, uh, I don't know, 100 years ago for uh, divers that they need to uh, to adjust their uh, pressure. It is working. Can you explain what is the difference? Well, first of all, is the pressure that you reach. Okay, so if we have, we need to reach two, at least two atmospheres. 100% oxygen in order to increase the blood oxygenation from 100 to 1500. Why is that? Because at that level, the amount of the dissolved oxygen is sufficient for all the energy demand, meaning you don't need the red blood cells. So by doing that, you can supply enough oxygen to a tissue that is fusion depleted, that have malfusion. So this is a crucial element number one. The fluctuation that needs to be generated in order to induce the heat, the stem cells proliferation, the angiogenesis, the neurogenesis, is fluctuation by going between 1,500 mercuries of oxygen back to around 100 to 150 mercuries of oxygen. These are the fluctuation, and you need to repeat that. All of those sacks full of air and all of these tubes are not reaching even close to that pressure. Okay. They are usually before, below 1.3. So this is, this is not it. It's homeopathic dose of whatever you want to use. So this is not the dose. This is one. Second, the quality assurance of these people who are buying these sacks in Home Depot and take them all or buy it from China or whatever they buy it from. There is, there is, the air that it's going inside is going from a compressor that you use at home. Nobody knows. Nobody knows really what's going inside. Okay. It's, it's unbelievable that people dare to think that what they are taking from this compressor, I think that nobody will dare to take a pipe from a compressor and breathe it in and out, in and out. I don't see any reasonable men doing that without quantity assurance that makes sure that indeed you don't have any oil, you don't have any infection, you don't have a lot of things that goes into your body. Nobody will be doing that. Okay, so it might be possible that at the first day when this with this crop is coming from the, uh, from the factory is coming out, maybe there is something good inside. But but think what happened a week after, a month after, two months after. Who dare to do it? It's, it's the most important thing what you take into your body. So I don't understand how people are going to do that. There is zero quality assurance. For example, if you will walk to medical grade hyperbaric chamber, which is actually a suite that you're going inside, you're going with the tender, somebody who takes you in, you're going to the appropriate place, the air is well controlled, the amount of ventilation of Refreshment of the air that you're doing should be in a level that prevent CO2 accumulation. So that's being controlled all the time. Okay, you have you have a continuous automatic control and technician that watch that, that check of the equipment and all of that. It's unbelievable what's going on around. So people, it's not only not effective; it's dangerous. So, so Shai, what, uh, let's assume that uh, I want to uh, go into hyperbaric uh, uh, treatment uh, chamber. Uh, what should I uh, look at before I'm selecting the place? How would I know that it's uh, uh, legit and not uh, uh, something that uh, might uh, make more harm than uh, benefit? So first of all, if it's a sack full of air or a tube, it's not it. Okay. Okay, let's start with that. Yeah. So people can people can write can write on Google Aviv clinics, okay, and they can see our clinic and they can see how a real chamber looks like. So first of all, it has to be a place is like you know, it's like an airplane that you're going in, sitting inside. There is 
a medical professional team over there, including a physician who have license to address or to give treatment to people, a license that they can lose if he's not doing it appropriately. It has to be professional physician, professional team. The equipment that being used should be FDA approved equipment. The pressure should be to two atmosphere. And, you know, it has to be medical grade. Just like you are going to the hospital. Anything that is, doesn't look like it, it's not it. And again, people can write a VIV clinic. They can go. They can see how it looks. Anything that looks different. I'm not, I'm not saying less fancy or less stylish. Things that look different than that, then this is not, this is not it. And if you want to to have longevity, definitely don't want to risk your health. You have to do it appropriately. Okay. And that, that's good. It's very good to know. Now let's go for the indication. What is the value of the hyperbaric uh, therapy, specifically for healthy people? Our audience would like to live better longer. So uh, if um, uh, I want to live better longer, what hyperbaric uh, a therapy will help me with? What is What are the benefits? So let's focus on the better because better is something that we can measure. Longer okay. and speculate. Okay. Absolutely. Be- better. Okay. And you're speaking with the science, so we have to evaluate everything. Yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. You're right. Every claim should be back up. So yeah. if we are speaking about normal, healthy population, we have, we are running in Israel probably one of of the most comprehensive studies done on normal aging population. And when I'm saying normal aging, I'm referring to people who are 65 years old or older, healthy, no diabetic, no stroke, no numbers, fully active, fully active in the daily routine. You know, us, okay, that's, yeah. that's a population. And we, in that study, we randomized to group. There is a treatment group, there is a control group. But if I want to conclude what we have already published on this population, so we can demonstrate improvement, not slowing a decline in the cognitive domain. Okay, it's all objectively measured by computerized testing, memory, information processing speed, executive function, and attention. That's happening because in MRI BTI, the MRI BTI stands for diffuse tomography imaging, where we can actually see the white finders in the brain. We can see that there is improvement in the amount of fiber, in the integrity of the fibers that we have, and angiogenesis in the brain, meaning the improvement in the cognitive function is reflected is a reflection of the change that we see in the brain. Okay, the improved tissue that we see in the brain. So this this is one thing. The other thing that we have evaluated related to cardiac and that that will soon be published that the same angiogenesis we have in the heart and that's been reflected by improvement in the physical performance. Okay. The VO2 max, how anaerobic threshold and, and the muscle performance. Okay. So this is another. The last element is, is down below and we spoke about it. This is related to erection uh, for people who doesn't have erection or good enough erection for enjoying a good sex life. Because of blood flow, not because of lack of testosterone or not because of neurological damage. With this regard, we can demonstrate this angiogenesis in the penis. People may have better erection. Another thing that we have done is related to the steep. We, our goal is not to improve the steep, but we did skin biopsies because the skin is accessible. You know, in the brain, we are looking at MRI, the heart in MRI and other stuff, but if we want to see what happened in the tissue, we need to do skin biopsies. So we did skin biopsies. We can see angiogenesis in the skin. We can see proliferation of stem cells. In accordance with that, you have more collagen and more elastic tissue in the skin, which is good. But again, this is not the primary goal of the treatment. The wrinkle will not disappear, okay? But the quality of the skin can be improved. And the last thing, which is 
probably the most exciting thing to see in human beings. For the first time in humans, we have demonstrated elongation of telomeres and the reduction of the senescent cell. And that made a lot of noise with opening the news all over. Because for the first time in humans, not in mice, not in rats, not in animal models, we can see that we can actually take the biology back in time at the cellular level. You know, some people claim, or based on the data that we have today, it means longevity. But again, we cannot claim longevity because this is something we have not measured. Okay, that's for okay. very long. But elongating telomeres. Reducing the senescent cell. Another thing that we have demonstrated on, on athletes, mid-age athletes, is mitochondrial proliferation and better function of the mitochondria. All of these come together to a better performance from different physical aspects because we are actually inducing regeneration wherever, wherever it needed. Okay, excellent. Sounds uh, like uh, the magic pill in a way. It's not um, a pill. It's not a pill. It's, no, no, I know. It's I know. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. It's no, no, and it's not magic. And it's not magic. It's pure biology. No, no, no. I'm, I'm saying that it's, it sounds uh, great. Uh, a, a couple of uh, uh, follow-up questions. The first one about uh, the effect on the senescent cells and the telomeres. I assume that you've done it in the biopsy of the skin cells. That's correct. In the skin uh, tissue. We have done, we have done it both. With regard to the senescent cell. First of all, we can evaluate the amount of the senescent cells in the blood, which is, okay. I don't want to say it's done, it's easily accepted, accessible. You can take a blood yeah. sample and you can measure the senescent cell. Okay. This, this study was already published, so people can read it. And the other thing indeed is in the skin biopsies, we can see also a decline, which is at the tissue level, not at the blood flow level. We can demonstrate. Uh, the significant decline in the senescence. Excellent. The, the second question is about uh, uh, the, uh, the sex performance. I assume that it's uh, related to male only, or, or is there any uh, advantage for women as well? You know, m women with everything related to sex are more challenging. Okay. Uh, so we haven't checked anything related to sexual function of women. And also with regard to the men, we are speaking specifically about the erection. Yeah, you need to have the desire, you need to have the hormones, yeah. you need to have the neurons. But if it's related to the blood flow, that's something we can tackle. And as you know, it's something very common to a lot of aging population. Excellent. As a Longevity by Design podcast listener, you understand the value of improving your health for today and for all the years ahead. And if you want to live your healthiest, longest life possible, you need to understand what's going on inside. At Inside Tracker, we take a personalized approach to health span optimization that eliminates guesswork from your wellness plan. Inside Tracker analyzes blood biomarker and DNA data, along with physiomarker data from fitness trackers like Aura Ring, to deliver personalized food, supplement, lifestyle, and exercise recommendations that allow you to take control and improve your health span. And for a limited time, Longevity by Design listeners can get 20% off at the Inside Tracker store. So if you're ready to receive a personal health analysis and data-driven wellness plan to optimize your body for the long haul, then it's time to start inside. Visit insidetracker.com slash podcast to get started today. That's insidetracker.com slash podcast to get started today. My next question is about the protocol. So what is the protocol to reach that? And is it the same for all the benefits, like the brain benefit, the heart benefit, uh, the skin benefit, or uh, you need to use a different protocol for each uh, organ? So first of all, our main focus is the brain. Okay. The other organs, I don't want to say it's a side effect because it's not a side effect. It's our, our bystanders, okay, they are coming along. So with regard to the brain, if we want to achieve good enough, or let's say appropriate neurogenesis and angiogenesis that will be reflected in the performance, the cognitive performance, we need 60 session, six zero session, it's daily session. Each session, it's two hours generating the fluctuation that we discussed five days a week. So it's not a magic. You know, with each session to the other, we are increasing the stem cells, we're triggering the different mediators that are responsible for the regeneration. 
And then you need to keep it up because it's not a single injection of stem cells. You need to increase it and let them walk, keep them up. So unfortunately, it's not a magic. It's biology and you need to invest, you need to invest the time for that. So 60 session every day for 60 days? For five days per week. So it means three months of investment. Yeah. yeah. And I assume that is also pretty expensive because it's a medical grade, uh, um, um, medical device that uh, uh, I assume that it's cost a lot of money to, to do it. A lot or not a lot. I don't know. I don't know what is a lot, you know, but. Generally speaking, you're right. The equipment is expensive. The quality assurance is expensive. The medical team that comes with it is expensive. So indeed, it's not a cheap one. Yeah. Whether it's expensive, yes or not, it's all relative. And people should judge from themselves. Okay. And then you've done it for 60 days or three months. Uh, then you need to repeat it after that or it's a one and done? You know what? You know what happened at the end of the treatment? People are sitting in front of me. We are sticking now. Terrified. Why they are terrified? Because then, you know, now my cognitive is better. I'm running faster. I'm practicing better. You know, my sexual life is better. So what will happen now? <laughs> and then I tell them, uh, relax. Now you're aging again. Okay. But don't okay. worry. We will keep on monitoring you. Okay. So of course, after you build up a tissue, then, then you have the slope again of declining, like anything that's coming out of the factory. Okay. But we are keep on monitoring and every six months we are doing reevaluation by cognitive test, by maximal counterpulmonary exercise test. And then you can monitor and see. And of course, the slope on the, of decline depends on a lot of parameters. Yeah, it depends on your DNA, depends on what you eat, on your environment, on a lot of issues. But once you can monitor, once you can measure, you can treat. But if you don't monitor and don't measure, you cannot know what you are doing. So every claim that we make, everything that we do is, is measurable. Okay, and we are targeting those measurable stuff. Okay. And uh, if you can uh, go for, uh, let's say, an average, I know that it's very hard. When is the time usually that you need to do it again? Is it a six months later, a year later, a few years later, or it's hard to say? So, you know, that everybody has also his biological weight. So, yeah. it's hard to say. But usually the results, let's say, Standard average 65 year old person who is fully adhered to the program and then is adhered to recommendation that we give to him based on his DNA, what he should read, what he should not eat. Usually in those cases, the results won't for at least two years. But of course, okay. if somebody has some rotation, some relevant rotation in the DNA, if he smoke, if he's, you know, not allowing smoking, but then if he eat and if he has diabetic that is uncontrolled, then the slope will be faster. Okay. And any advantages? You, you spoke about a, a population in around the, uh, 65 years old and older. Is there any advantage for, uh, let's say, uh, someone that is uh, highly athletic active and would like to improve his VO2 max or an uh, executive that is uh, working hard in the boardroom to do that, such a treatment earlier at the age of uh, 40, let's say? You are speaking with one. By the way, <laughs> you know, after, after our first drug study, when I saw the results, we still weren't a targeting aging population. When I sent the results, I said, oh my God, this is first of all, it's for me. So in the last 70 years, I'm doing to myself the full 60 session every two years. But what you are bringing up to the table now, it's something that is very interesting. You know that the people who are dedicating the time to the program, and are coming for the center that we have in Florida or the center that we have in Israel or the center that we have in Dubai are the busiest people that you will see on this planet. Okay. And they are not totally retired. They're opposite. They are still in the game. They want to stay in the game. It's clear to them 
that what they have between their ears is the most important tool that they have. So they are still, you know, it's like a race of Formula One. They are spinning the race and they want to continue to compete. So what they are doing, they are going to the pit stop. And this is actually their pit stop. And if you will try to schedule a meeting with those guys, God bless you. Let, let's see if you can make it. So especially those guys who are highly functioned, way above the average, fully functioned, age 50, 55, 60, surprisingly, it was a surprise for me at the beginning, but now it's clear to me. Those are the ones who are eager to get into the treatment and willing to make the commitment. It's a time commitment. It's not. The money is not the issue. It's the time committed for that. Yeah, yeah. They are traveling, they are coming, and they are doing that because they want to stay in the race, they want to compete. They want to stay in the race and not, not go, go outside. Yeah. So it sounds like there is no age that is too early to do that. Uh, but uh, definitely at the, around the 65, when you are uh, uh, supposed to see some decline because of the aging process, the, the benefit might be the highest. That's a fair assessment? That's a fair assessment, but you know, you know, we're speaking about longevity and, and life quality. So if we are looking about the quality of life, actually, you know, the slope began to decline after the age of 45. It's actually the age of 40 when we started to feel the decline. So if somebody is is elite performance. And when I'm saying elite performance, it's not necessarily an athlete. You know, a CEO runs a company, he's elite performance with his Absolutely. risk. He's elite performance with all risk. Yeah. Then people start to feel the slope of decline around this age. And what is interesting today is that people are not willing to take the normal for the age as granted anymore. Saying, why, what, what do you mean I'm normal to my age? This is, this is not good enough. I don't care about my age. I want to function in my maximal capacity for as long as possible. I call it enhanced medicine because you are not targeting the average anymore. Okay. You want to enhance how much to enhance as much as I can for myself. Why not? Okay. So that's, that's an interesting period that we are living in because you know, in the past, perhaps, and in the past, let's 100 years ago, two decades ago, the challenge that, that physician and scientist has were completely different. And the number one killer in, in young ladies was childbirth. Okay. That, that was the number one killer. Children were dying from diarrhea, from the hydration. Okay. So we need to develop antibiotics. So I assume that if I was here 100 years ago, and maybe I was, Okay, I was probably targeting developing antibiotica, developing solution for the abrasion, developing materials that we can do the delivery or surgery with appropriate with appropriate sanitation. Okay, probably I was dealing with that. However, today the number one threat to our society, and I'm saying society, I'm speaking about us as Homo sapiens, the Western society, is what we call age-related function and decline. And since this is the number one threat to our society, then scientists and physicians like me feels and know that it is legitimate to target aging or age-related function and decline as an appropriate target for us. Okay? Because it's appropriate target for our society, for our individuals. And, and and that's what's happening now. And this is exciting. Okay. You know, the amazing thing that happened after we published the telomere study is that a lot of young scientists were applying whether they can do their PhD in our, with our team. Now think about it. Somebody at the age of late 20 is coming and saying, I want to investigate age-related functional decline. And you're looking and saying, wow, this is amazing. Because those young people, young scientists, this is the most important resources that we have as a society. 
that will bring us to the next level. And the biggest advantage that we have was the beginning. They're saying, you know, it's like landing on the moon. You have led that one. Now you can do it better. And they yeah. take for granted that, that you can reverse the aging process. For them, it's not an issue. They just want to do it better. And since it's not a risky for them anymore, it's something that is tangible. They are willing to dedicate the career to such a topic. Take it a decade ago, nobody would have to think that he wants to dedicate his career to reversing the biology of aging. It was impossible to think about it. So now I'm thinking I'm, I'm most optimistic. I'm, I'm extremely optimistic. And the progress that we are making, we will make it better. We will make it faster. We will make it longer and more enjoyable. That's the most important. The journey should continue to be enjoyable. Okay. We're coming to this world for, for a journey. As long as. Absolutely. As long as we can see the view and as long as we can turn the wind on, on our screen, it's, it's a wonderful journey. But if. Absolutely. If you will sit in the car, in a dark car, you cannot see anything, you don't see anything. I don't want to be in that journey. So it's yeah. exciting time, exciting times. Yeah. So Shai, so far we discussed more about prevention. So take the 65 years old that are, I don't let's call say, it prevention. Uh, That's a treatment because you can meet okay. up before and after. No, no, I understand. But I'm saying those people don't have, uh, uh, they are not sick. They are normal for their age. And again, you said the normal is not uh, optimal. And I agree with you. That's what we are because that is the tracker, right? Nobody wants to be normal. We want to be the best that we can be. Okay. And I want to be better than what I was uh, 20 years ago. And I agree with you. That's, that's amazing. But now I would like, if it's okay with you, to switch gear and talk about, okay, treatment. So we have a, a, a population with dementia or a, a population that have, uh, or someone that have Alzheimer's disease or someone that have a loved one that have uh, Alzheimer's disease. And I know that the uh, uh, hyperbaric uh, uh, therapy also working uh, uh, on that. So can you discuss a bit about that and uh, what, uh, uh, what, what is the protocol and what are the benefits and a bit, uh, maybe the mechanism, if we understand what is the mechanism of using uh, this uh, a tool to uh, maybe delay the decline of such a uh, horrible diseases. So let's start, first of all, by understanding what we are doing. Okay, so we're treating a tissue. And we can take the study that we started on stroke patient. Okay, so because stroke is a classical model of injury. You have an acute insult, occlusion of blood vessels, and then you have a tissue that does not receive oxygen, and this tissue is damaged. Now, after each insult like this, you have several degrees of damage to the brain. The most severe one is necrosis. Necrosis means that the tissue is totally dead, and when we are speaking about brain, it means that the tissue was replaced with fluids. In that case, we cannot help yet okay why we cannot help because we don't have the infrastructure on which the stem cells can migrate and build up the neurons the blood vessels on the tissue that is needed so that's that's a totally lost tissue where we can help we can help with the tissue that is damaged but is not fully dead we call it penumbra, hibernating, stun, and metabolic dysfunction tissue. We have the infrastructure. We have the sense. It's not active. Okay. This is a damaged non-necrotic tissue that can persist for years without recovery. This is where we can help. Now, with the unique advanced imaging that we have today, we can demonstrate that tissue. We can differentiate between totally dead tissue when we cannot help to a metabolic dysfunction tissue where we can help to totally normal tissue where there is no need of any recovery. Based on this, we can set the expectation with the patient. We can tell him, I think that your head will move, the leg not. You want the treatment, take it. The leg, yes. The speaking capability, not, etc., etc. 
And setting up the expectation is the most important thing. Based on the algorithm and the knowledge that we have today, we can predict that with the new imaging that we have in an accuracy of more than 80%, which is not bad at all any means. So this is one. And for us, it doesn't matter if the primary cause of the damage is stroke or traumatic brain injury or an infection or post-COVID, which is a totally issue that the only thing that was proved thus far to help post-COVID patient is hyperoxic hypoxic paradox, not hyperbaric chamber, the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox. With respect to dementia and Alzheimer's disease, unfortunately, when somebody already had Alzheimer's on dementia, the brain is with significant atrophy. What do I mean by atrophy? There is a tissue that is lost, totally lost. And when we're looking at the brain, we see only fluids. Okay. So, so we don't have again the infrastructure. So probably when somebody have already full Alzheimer's, full dementia, it's too late. In the MCI period, usually it's mild cognitive period, we can do evaluation and based on what we see in the brain, we can predict if we can help or not. So that's the intermediate zone. Okay. So we are treating the tissue. I'm not treating a clinical presentation, treating Based on the unique imaging, the new advanced imaging that we see in the brain, we can, we can see what's going on, just like we see wounds in the leg. We can say if this type of wound of injury is suitable, yes or not, for the treatment. And based on this, make a decision whether to move forward, yes or not. Excellent. And uh, Shai, can you elaborate a bit about Alzheimer's and uh, describe the, the phase of uh, how the disease progress and what are the... Uh, let's say, the, the phenotype of Alzheimer's Alzheimer, uh, diseases? So we, we can categorize Alzheimer's disease to different, based on different categories. Category that I like the most, which I think, which is the relevant the most, is, you know, splitting early Alzheimer to late, to late Alzheimer. When we're speaking about early Alzheimer, it's an Alzheimer that happened before the age of, 50 or so, okay? That kind of Alzheimer is usually related to specific DNA mutation that those patients have, and this is the minority. Let's not focus on that, okay? But this is the minority. With regard to the classical age-related Alzheimer's disease, again, over there can be different, different subcategories of that. Generally speaking, the hallmarking of Alzheimer is when we see, if we see pathological evaluation, we can see amyloid plaque in the brain. In the past, we used to think that the amyloid is the primary cause of the disease because we can see amyloid plaque on those patients who develop Alzheimer. But today we understand that the amyloid is not the primary cause of the disease. It's actually a biomarker. It can, you know, facilitate the injury, but it's not the primary cause. How do we know that? After investing a lot of years in research and development of different kinds of antibodies or biological treatment that can take the amyloid out, we indeed, and I'm saying we are speaking about the scientific committee, we are indeed reach that target and we can take the amyloid out. However, unfortunately, we can see today that even taking the amyloid out doesn't make a significant clinical change. That tells us that, that it's a biomarker. It can, of course, facilitate the injury, but it's not the primary cause. So in many cases, the primary cause can be actually ischemia, which is a very common cause. Ischemia is lack of perfusion to the tissue. And when you have this lack of perfusion to the tissue, then you have hypoxia, lack of oxygen. Then you have inflammation. And as part of this inflammation process, you have a amyloid plaque in the brain. For example, with regard to that, we have amyloid model in mice. Okay, uh, You can see the amyloid plaque, everything related to it. And we took the mice into 
hyperbaric oxygen treatment, the same protocol that we use in humans, only in mice, small chambers. We haven't targeted the amyloid, but still, once we are inducing angiogenesis and neurogenesis, we can see that the amyloid plaque are being reduced or disappeared. Okay, not because we're targeting the amyloid plaque, because targeting the primary cause. We understand that inflammation and immune system play a crucial role also in Alzheimer's disease. And this is part of the work that Michal Schwartz, Professor Michal Schwartz from Israel is doing. So the insight that the amyloid is not the primary cause is bringing a lot of hope because we are looking at a different way to tackle the disease and not tackling the amyloid, tackling the primary cause that may lead to accommodation. We are running now in Israel one of the comprehensive studies done on prodromal Alzheimer. What do we mean by prodromal Alzheimer? Prodromal Alzheimer means that we are taking patients that have MCI, mild cognitive impairment. They already have cognitive impairment, but not dementia. They function. They understand. They can speak with us. They can understand what we're saying. They understand the meaning. But they are starting to lose it. Short memory, mostly. We can see, we are taking the population that we see ischemic lesions in the brain, and we have PET scan to amyloid to demonstrate the amyloid in the brain. And taking this population and we randomize them then into two groups. There is a treatment group, conserva group. Let's see what will come up in this study. We always try to push. It. So this is pushing the limited step forward. Taking it not normal aging, not standard MCI, but prodromal Alzheimer. And let's see if we can reverse also the damage at that level. If at that level, it's not too late. So the study is running now and we'll have to wait and see what, what will come up. Excellent. Thank you so much. I think that it's uh, very beneficial for our audience to understand the Alzheimer and the, and the current hypothesis that I agree with has changed significantly in the last few, few years uh, based on what you said. Um, another question is about a stroke patient, and uh, I assume that uh, uh, your uh, treatment uh, might work even better on that than uh, on the Alzheimer because basically you can uh, bypass the, uh, the area of the blockage. Is that correct? This is correct, but again, we have to see the significance of the necrotic tissue. If there is a totally big or large area of necrotic tissue, and our ability to help is, is limited. But again, you know, I'm, I'm not judging. My job as a physician is to translate the knowledge that I have to a language that the patient can understand. And once he understands my knowledge in his way, whatever decision that he's making, if it's not look out of range totally to me, I will respect it and move forward with it. And I will give you an example. There are people that sits in front of you that tells you, uh, you know, if my hand will not move, I don't want the treatment. But you tell them, but you will be able to speak again. No, no, no. They're saying only my hand. Or they will say, if I cannot walk, I will not want the treatment. But you will tell them, you know, you will be able to have a better memory and cognition. But they're saying no. And on the other end, there is the other extremities of people who don't care about the physical performance. All they care about is, is the cognition. So again, by doing brain imaging and the evaluation that we are doing, we can set the expectation. And that's the important thing to translate the knowledge that you have to a better understanding of the patient of what he can gain with the treatment and let him decide, you know, I'm, I'm not judging. I'm not judging whatever decision it is. For some people, just moving the finger, it's a huge achievement, even though we are not bringing them to the normal. For others, a significant improvement can look ridiculous as compared to the others. So our job is to translate. You know, Dr. Dolittle, we used to read that book together, I think, when we were children. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> Speak with any animal in, in the language, with everybody in the language that he can understand. And that's, that's our job. Excellent. Um, so Shai, uh, absolutely a fascinating uh, discussion. And I would like to wrap up with a, 
a question about uh, what is your uh, a top tip uh, for cognition or brain health? What do you recommend our audience to do if they want to keep their uh, brain and cognition health in the top, uh, boy, being optimal, not just normal? What should they do? So the first and most important thing, I know that you expect me to say things, eat that, do that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but No, I, I want to hear your sincere answer. The most important thing, the number one, is make yourself need the body. You know, people ask me, what is the definition of an old man? They expect me to say the telomere length, the amount of senescence, uh, you know. The cognitive, what you see in MRI, things like that. But my definition is, is totally different. You know, when you are speaking with an old man, he always tell you, I used to do that. Before I did that, I did that. And I did that. And when you are speaking to a young man, he will always say, I'm planning on doing. Okay. And after I will do that, I will do that. So some of my clients who are 90 and above have still plan on doing stuff, okay? And they have plans for the next 20 years. So if somebody is coming to me and he doesn't have a plan for the future, I will not treat him. I'm saying at the beginning, first of all, go make your homework. I want to have a plan what you want to do. Because the most important thing for staying in the game is to have a mission, a mission that the body should try to achieve. If you don't have that, you're lost and nobody can help you. But once you have this, then we can help with the biology. This is easy. But that's the most important thing. Yeah, no, I, it's a, a, a great answer and unique answer and uh, uh, I haven't been uh, expecting you to say it that, but uh, yeah, excellent uh, answer. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Shai. And I would like to wrap up by uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Efrati, for coming to our uh, show and uh, giving us a uh, wealth of information uh, about uh, cognition and the other uh, positive effect of uh, hyperbaric uh, uh, therapy. I'm looking forward to exploring the research in the field of longevity each month with you and other leading scientists. For more information, please go to www.insertracker.com slash podcast. Thank you so much, Shai. Bye. All the best. Thanks for listening to Longevity by Design. Please subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Longevity by Design is powered by Inside Tracker a personalized health optimization platform that helps people improve their lives by improving their bodies from the inside out using personalized, science-backed recommendations for nutrition, supplements, and lifestyle changes. To learn more, visit InsideTracker.com slash podcast.